Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having a great day, a great weekend, and, and all of that good stuff. Uh, greetings. Uh, I'm going to get right to it. Uh, before I do, a real quick reminder, we are in the midst of a fundraiser to support all the work we do in the community. Uh, if you know, you know. If you're familiar with what we've done, what I've done over the past 30 years, and you believe in that work from the research, which is so desperately needed, to the programs that we've developed, to the advocacy uh, programs we have, mental health, domestic violence, uh, addiction, all of this stuff. If you believe in that, support it because it's so desperately needed. Now, let, let me talk to you real briefly about a point that needs to be made here. Uh, thanks uh, to some brilliant minds like Dr. Naeem Agbar, uh, Franz Fanon, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, Dr. Amos Wilson, Dr. Joy DeGru, uh, and others. And I'll come in through the back door on that with all the work I've done in the area of multi-generational transmission of trauma and the connectivity to certain current social conditions or even socioeconomic conditions as it relates to the black community at large. Uh, thanks to those brilliant minds, we've had and still have an abundance of information uh, both experiential and pragmatic and empirical uh, evidence to the fact that there is trauma being passed down that can be traced back as far as slavery. Um, and there's so many different ways that we have been traumatized. That's without question. Uh, we've talked about it. I've done extensive work over the past 20 years in epigenetics and its influence not only on trauma and the perpetuation of trauma but on disease and illness perpetuated uh, from experiences that happen in childhood like such such as adverse childhood experiences did a, just finished doing a workshop on adverse childhood experiences but even in, as adults our, our environments and the level of stress anxiety and worry we spend in those environments have traumatic influences uh, and we talk about that but what we are going to have to do as a people is start moving towards healing uh, to talk about it does nothing to acknowledge it is a point of origin or initiative you know, you acknowledge something that gives you a place where you start, okay, this is what's going on, but it has to be followed by something. Uh, it has to be followed by a plan of action, in this case, for healing. Um, you know, I, like I said, I've talked to him, I've talked about all of the injuries uh, from slavery. We were robbed of our values, our interests, our principles, our identity, uh, our spirituality, our sense of self, our heritage. Uh, uh, subsequently, we had superimposed and inculcated into our psyche the identity given to us by our captors and our oppressors um, for the whole purpose of subjugation and control. That identity has been passed down and eventually voluntarily passed down by us ourselves in our behaviors and our demands and our thirst to be accepted and our demand to be a part of something uh, that we have lost any sense of responsibility to ourselves to find healing and the funny thing is the matter the way that I uh, discovered epigenetics are at least gained a better understanding of epigenetics was in studying the Jewish Holocaust uh, for the purpose of looking at the Jewish Holocaust for the purpose of looking um, at how 
they dealt with trauma versus how we deal with trauma now. We're talking 246 years of chattel slavery. We're talking 12 years of reconstruction. We're talking 70 plus years of Jim Crow segregation. We're talking an ongoing uh, in, in, uh, infringement uh, in the way of mass incarceration, miseducation, mis gentrification, uh, discrimination, and so much more that we're still experiencing. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So, but, so uh, in my mind, there's no comparison, actually, but if you look at it, Jews don't just have a recognition of what they've went through. They frame it differently, but the, and, and the one thing you never are going to be able to tell a Jewish person is to forget it. It's been long enough, let it go. That's not going to happen, and it'll get you hemmed up real quick. Uh, on the flip side, we're constantly being told to forget it and let it go. No, we don't forget it, but we definitely need to reframe it when I'm studying it. The one thing I found is in the 12 years of this Holocaust, in the 12 years of this Holocaust, the experiences of those who went through it were horrific. That can't be denied. They were horrific. It lasted 12 years. We're talking 400 plus years right now, but 12 years. What we find is two generations removed, well, a second generation removed, grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, meaning they weren't born during the Holocaust, they were born after, were experiencing dreams and nightmares of real things that happened in the Holocaust, even though they had never been told specifically about it. We're not talking about the general things that share as a means of saying, we went through this and we made it, so you're strong type thing. We're talking about very specific things that were unique to their grandparents. And they would share this and the grandparents knew, okay, something's going on here. So they literally invested in studies to understand. And so the epigenetic research was in its infancy and we were talking, we were studying the influences of uh, gene influence, how genes are upregulated and downregulated, how disease, disease genes literally turn on and turn off, how immune genes turn on and turn off and all this stuff. And so what we find out is not only can every traumatic experience create what we call an epigenetic tag, an actual imprint on genes, on every cell, that, that it, it's literally recorded in the cellular data that's held in every cell of your body. So billions of cells are recording this and, 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 and processing it through its own unique identity within the body. Um, and we, we understand that, but also we find out that the continued strain and stress of ongoing infringement and it doesn't have to be at the level of intense trauma so okay what 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 blacks have gone through is intense what jews went through during that 12 year period were intense but just the strain and stress of not knowing how you're going to pay your bill the strain and stress of knowing as a black man i'm gonna go out in this car there's a likely chance that i'm gonna get pulled over and it's definitely a greater chance i'm gonna get pulled over versus a white person uh despite the fact that white people are more than likely to be doing something to get pulled over for or even arrested or accosted but the, that we, never, we don't talk about that and it's not presented that way. I'm actually presented as being more criminal minded than whites even though whites definitely when it comes to drugs are more likely to have drugs on them than blacks. Period. That's statistically proven. And I mean, I don't mean by a little bit, I mean like three times more likely to have drugs. But I'm going to be the one that's going to get stopped, pulled over, car searched, and maybe even shot and I ain't did nothing. Imagine that stress. Imagine that strain. Imagine what that does to the body. It does. It imprints on the body daily. It creates this constant state of fight or flight at some level, which cortisol and adrenaline is being released into the body. Cortisol in short bursts for short periods of time is great for being able to take on challenges where you might have to run and get out of the way of a car or a dodge an accident or whatever. It's, 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 a, it's a responsive mechanism that is meant to put you in a safe space when you're not in a safe space. So either fight or run. But when you're constantly in that state, the cortisol begins to attack the body. But more importantly, stress begins to trigger genes, cancer genes, autoimmune genes, 
uh, so many other genes. Diseases are primarily driven by stress, environmental situations. And so you look at life expectancy and so much more. So then what must we do? We must first gain an understanding of how it happens so that we can battle it. There's a lot of stuff. I've, I, like I said, I've been writing on this for years. I've, I've written on it with such intensity and extensiveness that I've literally been contacted and asked twice to speak at the International Conference for Epigenetics and Cancer. Um, so, and I, I just started trying to learn about cancer, you know, even though I've always been in some way in the health, fitness, health, uh, holistic health area. Uh, first, my first business was Stay Fit Fitness and Training, which is now Master Fitness 21. I've been in that, you know, genetics, was not my thing. We're talking about biology, genetics, you know, uh, you have to know a certain amount of that to be in it. But uh, what I discovered is just in learning this, it just dope, drove me in. We, we, we look at carcinogens as a cause of cancer, and they do. We look at genetic history. Uh, some things are just passed down, uh, and it is. But that is in a small number percentage wise compared to how much of these diseases uh, uh, are, are driven by uh, environmental stressors. Uh, adverse childhood experiences. ACEs, uh, more, more affectionately known within the industry. ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Anything from uh, abuse, uh, whether it's emotional abuse, uh, physical abuse, um, or psychological abuse, whether it's neglect in those same different ways. Uh, parents breaking up, divorcing, um, parents becoming incarcerated, parents addicted to um, a controlled substance or alcohol, um, those type things, sexual abuse, those type things are all aces. Each one gets a point. A child who experiences four aces during their childhood two and a half more times likely to develop some form of chronic illness 12 times more likely to attempt suicide, four times more likely to develop ischemic heart disease, which is the number one killer in America, uh, four times more likely to develop uh, lupus, four times more likely to develop certain forms of cancer, and I can go on and on. And this isn't just if it continues, this is if they experience it during their childhood, it's going to play out in their death light. It's going to have long reaching ramifications on a physiological health perspective. Really? research then come up with reason because what I'm telling you is there's a lot of things even when we go into uh, elementary school classes and little Lil Derek is being uh, cate categorized as, or classified as being learning disabled oppositionally defiant uh, a, uh, suffering from ADHD and, and then more than likely going to be given an IEP but also assigned a psychiatrist who will prescribe them some form of a psychotropic drug like Ritalin, Vyvanse, Concertin, uh, Adderall uh, and on and so what, what happens uh, when, when that happens now they are docile because the drug seduces them uh, but the drug is, number one, a psychotropic drug, so it's altering the chem chemistry of their brain. Second of all, it is addictive. So now you are putting them in a situation where you are literally at five years old giving a kid a drug that they will become addicted to. Um, and then you wonder why there's a drug problem. But then what happens is you alienate that kid because that kid doesn't feel safe, doesn't feel accepted, doesn't feel received in that environment, becomes alienated from the academic process and ultimately drops out, increasing their risk of incarceration by five times. Uh, this is not an accident. 
But what happens is when we don't deal with our trauma, it plays out in the open world where we're not given uh, the latitude or the awareness or understanding of where this behavior is coming from. We're only judged by it and persecuted and prosecuted by it. And it's our responsibility. We are going to have to learn how to deal with it. We're going to have to address it on a grand scale. This is real. This isn't some, you know, um, collective cognitive uh, dominative bias is a theory I developed about 25 years ago on the collective idea, or ideology, or identity and framing of the black community of how the world around them operates and their corresponding responses and behaviors to it. And it's real. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. Um, when people say, Doc, just let it go, they're not going to get it. And, you know, the reason I haven't let it go is I know why they don't get it. I understand that there are some things working against it. It's, you know, it's like, it's not logical, it's not rational, it's not reasonable because we're not functioning from that. And the thing is, you don't know you're not functioning from it because your reality is your frame. Your reality is the paradigm through which you're villain to you. This is just what is, but the reality of it is you're working against yourself. It's nothing more difficult. And this is what I do for a living. I literally work with people trying to help people who may not even realize they need help. There's nothing more difficult than get somebody who needs help, but doesn't believe they need help to get help. It is a massive uh, undertaking. It is very, very, uh, time intensive uh, it requires patience it re requires a level of commitment and what I'm telling you is we've got to number one protect our children we've got to create better environments because our children are growing up in situations that we call culturally normal and actually they are dysfunctional and toxic and we don't know it we're, we're setting them up for failure because we're not providing the right environment. We have a, we're birthing kids into traumatic experiences and not even realizing it. That's something that is on us. We've got to do better. We need to have programs within every city. We need to have protocols with every, in every city. I can tell you now because I'm actually working with people. There's no real true protocol or response for people struggling with any form of psychosis until it's too late. You can't get help until it's too late. Same thing in the system for domestic violence. You can't really get the help you need until you're hurt or dead. Same thing with someone suffering and struggling with a form of psychosis. We can't really do anything to them. Uh, they haven't harmed anybody. They haven't said they were going to harm themselves. But you are giving them all of this behavior that's simply not on the chart. But you are wanting me to sit here and say, okay, well, when he does this or when she does this, and then it's too late. Either they've harmed somebody or now they have a record. Do you see where this happens in this cycle that's going on? And it's going to be prevalent. It's going to happen in every group and every race, but it's going to be prevalent among us because we got unaddressed trauma. I could talk about this unaddressed trauma uh, literally for days and barely, barely scratch the surface. And I'm going to do the best I can. So this week's series is going to be on trauma. Last week's series was on the miseducation of black youth. This week's series is going to be on trauma. But we've got to do a better job of addressing it and doing something about it. Because that's a great deal of the inhibitance of our ability to come together, unify, and create power. And not just talk about it. So on that level, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Like I said, if you believe in the work I'm doing... Uh, whether it's the research center, the think tank, uh, the program implementation, the advocacy uh, programs we have, go into the description box. There are a number of different ways that you can show your love and support for what we do and give. This is something we're going to be pressing. This is something we're going to be pushing, but I'm going to keep sharing with you and hopefully enough of us get it till we understand. It's not to condemn those who don't get it. It's to understand why so that we can become resources and help the healing process. This isn't a flip of a switch reality that's going to take place. We're talking about 400 years of oppression and trauma. It's going to take a while to get under. It's going to take a couple of generations, but we've got to plant the seeds. And that's why we, that's one of the problems we have. If we can't see an immediate result, we don't get involved in things. And so we keep falling victim to our own short-sightedness. I'm challenging everyone who sees this to take a real long, hard look at where you're at and how you're viewing things.
how far are you willing to look in the future and say, I'm willing to plant a seed in something that I may not even live see come to fruition? They're doing that to us. They're planting seeds that they their grandchildren are going to reap. And our grandchildren are going to reap the whirlwind. We've got to catch up. On that note, look, I'm about to get off here. I got to run here and grab a couple of things. Uh, but you guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. And we'll talk soon. I'm out. Yeah, yeah. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here Dropping in with a little special announcement For those who have followed me for any stretch of time You know outside of the businesses that I run Like Myriad Business Solutions The Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, In Houston, Dallas and other areas uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.